Hi, this is the fourth video of chapter 5, General Equilibrium and Economic Efficiency. In this video, we are going to talk about Walras Law and Relative Prices. Okay, so just to begin, we know that in a two-person exchange, the outcome can depend on the bargaining power of the two parties. However, competitive markets have many buyers and many sellers. So if people do not like the terms of an exchange, if they don't want to trade with some specific buyer or seller, they can look for another seller who offer better terms. So as a result, each buyer and its seller is going to take the price of the goods as fixed so they are price takers and they just have to decide how much to buy or how much to sell at these prices. We can show how competitive markets lead to efficient exchange by using the eight for box to mimic a competitive market. Okay, so if we have the eight for box, we can mimic this competitive market, this perfect competition that we studied in, in the first chapter. This slide is going to show the opportunities for trade when we start at the location given by the point A. Okay, so we are starting from here, and when the prices of both, both food and clothing are equal to one, I mean, not the actual prices, but the relative prices. It is the price of one good divided by the price of the other good. So if the price are equal, the prices of both goods are equal then the relative prices will be one so the actual prices don't matter what matters is the price of food relative to the price of clothing when the prices of food and clothing are equal each unit of food can be exchanged for one unit of clothing as a result the price line which is pp prime this is the price line in the diagram has a slope of minus one because it will be exchanged one by one and it describes all possible allocations that exchange can achieve. So let's suppose that we have many James and many currents in our market and each James is in our market is going to decide to buy two units of clothing and sells two units of food in exchange. So this is going to move him from A to C, okay, from the point A to the point C. There will be an increase in satisfaction because we will change from the indifference curve UJ1 to UJ2. So we will pass to another utility, another utility function, another, not a utility function, sorry, but indifference curve. So this will be a new indifference curve, which is farther from the origin for James, so he will be better, in a better situation in C than in A. In the meanwhile, each current is going to buy two units of food and sells two units of clothing. And this will move her or each current from A to C. So she or they, all the currents are going to increase their satisfaction because they will change from this utility function uk1 from util from this one to the one which is uk2 which is in c or it pass through the point of c okay so she will also increase her utility from a to c from uk1 to uk2 so we choose prices for the two goods so that the quantity of food demanded by each garden in this market is equal to the quantity of food that each James wishes to sell. And the quantity of clothing demanded by James is equal to the quantity of food that each garden wishes to sell. And as a result, the market for food and clothing are in equilibrium. So here we will, we will have an equilibrium. An equilibrium is a set of prices at which the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied in every market. So here we will find an equilibrium, as we can see, for both Karen and James, because their 
um, their utility, their indifference curve are tangent here, and they are also tangent to the price line. However, not all the prices are consistent with an equilibrium. For example, if the prices of food is one and the price of clothing is three, food must be exchanged for clothing on a three to one basis. But then each James would be unwilling to trade any food to get additional clothing because his or their marginal rate of substitution of clothing for food, if you remember from the past uh, slides, was 0 0.5, one half. Each Karen, on the other hand, would be happy to sell clothing to get more food, but she has no one to trade with. So the market will be therefore in the equilibrium because the quantity demanded is not equal to the quantity supplied. So we will have a disequilibrium. And this disequilibrium should only be temporary because in a competitive market, prices will adjust if there is excess demand. In some markets, this means that the quantity demanded of one good is going to be greater than the quantity supplied and there will be excess supply in others, which means that the quantity supplied will be greater than the quantity demanded. So in our example, each current demand for food is going to be greater than each James' willingness to sell it at a price of one uh, over three. The relative price was one over three. So whereas each current willingness to trade clothing is greater than each James' demand for it, as a result of this excess demand for food and excess supply of clothing, we will expect the price of food to increase relative to the price of clothing. And as the price, the prices are changing, the demands of all the people who are in the market will change as well. So eventually, the prices will adjust until an equilibrium was reached. So if we find a disequilibrium in the beginning and we have a competitive market, at the end we will find an equilibrium because the prices will adjust at some point. So therefore, there is a difference between an exchange with only two people and an exchange with many people involved when we have competitive, a competitive market. If there are only two people, if we have only two traders, the bargaining process is going to leave as an indeterminate outcome. However, when we have many people involved in the market, the price of, of the goods are going to be determined by the combined choices of demanders and suppliers of goods. So we can see that the point C is an allocation that is efficient, as I, as I have said. It is a competitive equilibrium which is efficient. The indifference curve are tangent. Okay, so just to continue, the, the idea that we have just explained is illustrated by uh, Adam Smith with his invisible hand. And this will be the first theorem of welfare economics. If everyone trades in the marketplace and all mutually beneficial trades are completed, the resulting equilibrium allocation will be economically efficient. So let's summarize what we know about a competitive equilibrium from the consumer's perspective. First, because the indifferent curves are tangent, all marginal rates of substitution between consumers will be equal. And second, because each indifference curve is tangent to the price line, each person marginal rate of substitution of clothing for food is going to be equal to the ratio of prices of the two goods. Okay, so we will have this, that marginal rate of substitution for James uh, between food and clothes will be equal to the uh, price line, to the relative prices, and it will be equal to the marginal rate, rate of substitution for current uh, between food and clothes, which means that we are in equilibrium. Okay. okay, so just to continue, in this slide we put the information from the Edward box in a different form. Here we have James utility in this axis, in this horizontal axis, and in the vertical axis we have current utility. 
Any point in the export box corresponds to a point in this figure because every allocation generates a utility for both people and every movement to the right every movement to the right is going to represent an increase in James utility and every movement upward is going to represent an increase in Karen's utility. So the utility possibilities frontier represents all allocations that are efficient. And we see that E, F, and G are obviously points from the contract curve, so they are all efficient. All the points that are on this curve are efficient in this utility possibility frontier. And then the point H will represent an inefficient allocation. H is not efficient, it's inefficient. You have it here in the text. And then we have L, we see which is not attainable. It's not attainable because there is not enough goods to generate the levels of utility that this point represents. So the utility possibilities frontier then is going to describe all efficient allocations of resources measured in terms of the utility levels of two individuals. And in economics, we often use a social welfare function to describe the well-being of the society as a whole in terms of the utilities of individual members. And then, this is extracted from the first slide, the Walras law is an economic theory which states that the existence of excess supply in one market must be matched by excess demand in another market so that both factors are balanced out. So the Walras law asserts that an examined market must be in equilibrium if all other markets are in equilibrium. Okay, so at the end, all the markets will be in equilibrium. then if individual preferences are convex then every allocation every point of the contract curve that we have shown in this utility frontiers uh, in this utility possibilities frontier every efficient allocation is a competitive equilibrium for some initial allocation of goods so literally this theorem tell us that any equilibrium deemed to be equitable can be achieved by a suitable distribution of resources among individuals and that such a distribution is going to need not in itself generate inefficiencies. So at the end, unfortunately, all programs that redistribute income in our society are economically costly, but at the end we want to find efficiency. So um, just to close this uh, this this part of the chapter we should focus on this point that we could find we can find an equilibrium if we have a competitive market and that the welfare uh, sorry the Waller's law is this economic theory that tells us that if there is an excess supply it could be matched with an excess demand so we can find out at the end uh, a general equilibrium. Okay, and um, that's all for this video. See you in the next one.